to our program today, and thank you for joining us. I'm Larry Jacobs. I'm a professor at the University of Minnesota's Humphrey School of Public Affairs in the Department of Political Science. And this program today is sponsored by the Center for the Study of Politics and Government at the Humphrey School of Public Affairs, where I direct it. Before we begin today, I want to invite you to participate. Very important part of our program. You'll see at the bottom of the screen that little Q&A button. Click it, give us questions. It's an important part of our program and we will be getting to as many as possible. Let's begin today's program. Money in elections matter. Joining us for today's conversation are professors, Professor Catherine Pearson, who's here at the University of Minnesota, Department of Political Science, George Beck, with Clean Elections Minnesota, and Ricardo Lopez, Minnesota reformer. Professor Pearson is a distinguished scholar and associate professor in the Department of Political Science. Her research focuses on the Congress and elections, on political parties and women in politics. She co-authored the report that we'll be discussing today with me. The name of the report is Transparency and Campaign Spending in Minnesota, and we'll put up a link to that in a moment. Um, uh, the report was funded by the McKnight Foundation. George Beck is the current chair of Clean Elections Minnesota, working on educating Minnesota on electoral processes and advocating for transparency and fair elections. Mr. Beck also served four years as chair of the Minnesota Campaign Finance and Public Disclosure Board, which is very important in this area, and worked as an administrative law judge in Minnesota for almost 30 years. Ricardo Lopez is the senior political reporter at the Minnesota Reformer. Mr. Lopez previously reported in the Dayton administration and Minnesota legislature for the Star Tribune from 2014 to 2017, and has extensively covered campaign finance in Minnesota. It's my pleasure now to turn it over to Ricardo Lopez. Thank you so much, Larry. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm, I'm glad to see so many of you still have an interest in discussing the 2020 election, part, in particular the campaign finance portion of it. Um, you know, last year was a presidential election year, which obviously drew a lot of money. And so I'm really glad to be able to facilitate this conversation between Professor Catherine Pearson and, and George Beck today to discuss uh, some of these some of these remarkable sums of money that that were spent in the 2020 election. So I just want to um, you know start us off with an overview of the report that Professor Pearson, if you would be so kind of walk us through. Great, thank you. Thank you, Larry, for that generous introduction and for convening us. And thank you to George and Ricardo for joining me today to unpack the ways in which money fuels politics, the implications, and what we can do about it. The 2020 elections set campaign spending records in Minnesota and nationally. Nearly $163 million were spent on elections in Minnesota during 2020, far exceeding spending in the last presidential election year, 2016. This includes direct contributions to candidates' campaigns and the massive, often undisclosed, independent expenditures made by parties, groups, corporations, unions, associations, and individuals that influence specific election contests. At the federal level, $105 million was spent on Minnesota's campaign, the campaigns for the U.S. Senate and the House of Representatives. Nearly $80 million of that was spent on Minnesota's eight U.S. House races nearly 30 million more than in 2016. Collectively, Republicans outspent Democrats on the eight U.S. House races and Democrats outspent Republicans on Minnesota's U.S. Senate race in support of Tina Smith. In the most competitive U.S. House races, districts one and seven, independent expenditures by groups and parties overshadowed the candidates' own campaigns and their own spending. Independent expenditures comprise 76% of spending to support Michelle Fishbach's bid for office and 68% of Colin Peterson's. These were the second and third most expensive U.S. House races in the state. Surprisingly, Minnesota's fifth district, a solidly Democratic district re uh, that re-elected Representative Ilhan Omar with 64% of the vote, attracted the most spending, 26% of all spending on House races in Minnesota. 
Unlike the first and seventh districts, however, the fifth district did not attract significant outside spending as the outside groups were well aware that Republican Lacey Johnson didn't pose a significant threat to Representative Omar and outside groups tend to spend strategically to maximize their likelihood of affecting the outcome. Instead, it seems that individual donors from across the country were motivated by the symbolic significance of supporting or opposing one of the first Muslim women elected to the US House of Representatives who was also a frequent target of President Trump and a highly visible member of the squad. Overall, pro Johnson spending topped spending for Omar by more than $8 million. I wanna turn now to Minnesota's elections for the state legislature. Nearly 41 million was spent on Minnesota's elections for the state Senate and state House of Representatives so concentrated in the most competitive districts and that total was nearly 10 million more than was spent in 2016, the last time seats in both chambers were up. In the state legislative races, DFL candidates for both the House and Senate had a combined overall advantage of over $11 million. Independent expenditures by parties, groups, corporations, unions, associations, and individuals flooded these competitive races, obscuring candidates' own voices. Importantly, and I know George will talk more about this, much of this election spending is dark money by nonprofits that don't disclose their donors, including corporations, individuals, and unions. This is a bipartisan issue. This lack of disclosure happens with nonprofits who make independent expenditures to support candidates of both parties in Minnesota and nationally. 59% of overall spending benefiting DFL legislative candidates came from independent expenditures compared to 50% for Republican candidates. Independent expenditures in Minnesota flowed into Senate races in particular. Senate DFL candidates benefited from over $10 million, which was 68 percent of all spending uh, in independent expenditures, and Senate Republican candidates benefited from over $5 million in independent expenditures, or 60 percent of spending on Senate races. We issued a similar report after the 2018 elections, and we found similar patterns of massive spending and independent expenditures. Following the 2018 elections, a team of graduate students from the University of Minnesota's Humphrey School of Public Affairs and the Department of Political Science conducted analyses of committee activity in the state legislature to examine what, if any, ties exist between campaign donations and legislative activities. They detailed the campaign contributions received by members on each committee and tracked every committee hearing uh, recording which individuals testified on every bill that came before seven key committees during public hearings the year after the 2018 elections. We found that Minnesota donors exercised influence. They gained access to the committee and the promotion of their interests through testifying in public hearings, giving them opportunities to shape committee decisions by providing key information that promotes their interest. We also saw that priorities of both parties but particularly majority party DFL priorities, shape legislative activities in the committees that we examined. This is not surprising as they reflect the preferences of members and leadership, but it is worth noting that independent expenditures by party affiliated groups top the list of independent expenditures, both in 2018 and 2020. These patterns of spending make partisan politics a team sport, contributing to the rise of partisan polarization that makes legislating difficult in today's era. Finally, a bit about Minnesota donors in the 2020 presidential election. Individual Minnesota donors contributed $16.7 million to one of the two major party presidential candidates in 2020, more than 10 million, uh, more than 10 million more than in 2016. In 2020, Joe Biden collected 61% of Minnesotans' contributions compared to Trump's 39% of contributions. Trump, however, in 2020, attracted considerably more support than he had in 2016, when he received only 22% of Minnesotans' contributions. In conclusion, I encourage you to read more of the details of the report online, but I want to reiterate the significant increase in spending from 2016 to 2018 to 2020, both in Minnesota and nationally, and the even sharper rise in independent expenditures, many of which provide no accountability to voters because they are fueled by dark money. Great, thank you so much, Catherine. Those are some really, really big numbers. So I wanna be able to get some reaction here 
Um, from George, I know I, you had some thoughts. We talked about this report previously. Um, you know, give us, you know, given your background and, 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 and your experience, give us a sense about, you know, what this report says and what to you is, is most alarming about, but about what Professor Pearson just laid out. Thank you, Ricardo. Um, the first thing I want to mention is that this report is a major contribution to understanding campaign finance in Minnesota. Um, Thank you, Professor Pearson and Professor Jacobs. And thank you to those um, probably unremunerated students who helped you in the, in the research. Um, I'm, I'm firmly convinced that the more Minnesotans learn about campaign finance and how our elections operate, the, the stronger the support for reform. And that's certainly the direction that I'm hoping we're going to go. So as Professor Pearson mentioned, this is eye-popping. $41 million for the state legislature alone in uh, campaign funding. A sharp increase, like up 10 million from the last election. Um, but even more alarming to me is the unlimited independent expenditures or super PACs that are operating in Minnesota races. Most of this was unknown before 2010 when the Citizens United came down. Uh, that decision resulted in uh, independent expenditure committees that can spend as much as they feel like. In other words, no contribution limits. So um, a majority of the funding in 2020 for the legislature was uh, independent expenditures, almost 23 million. Well, that's a huge change from the way we used to operate elections in our country and needs to be very carefully examined. Um, I think it's clear that national and um, special interest money is uh, being contributed into Minnesota to influence our state legislature. I know that many special interests think it's easier to influence a state legislature than it is to influence Congress because it doesn't, it just doesn't cost as much. Um, and so uh, super PACs have been very active in Minnesota. So um, <clears throat> another interesting thing in this report is that public subsidies, uh, amount to only 5% of contributions. And so that tells me that a great percentage of special interest money is provided for our candidates. And um, I, I think that means that that's where they are looking for um, the lead as to what direction they should go in. Now, in my view, higher public subsidies are the best way to combat buying votes in light of the Citizens United decision, which allows for unlimited contributions through super PACs. So how do we do that? Well, House File 9 was authored by Representative Greenman in the session, and it had a couple of significant ideas that I think ought to be considered in Minnesota. Uh, one was something called democracy dollar coupons to be provided to uh, Minnesota voters and they can pass those along to the candidates that they think uh, are, the, are the best candidates. It also proposed a small donor match program uh, at a six to one match for contributions up to $100. These are not exactly new ideas. Um, Seattle has a voucher program. Registered voters get four $25 vouchers that they then provide to the candidates of their choice. It's been a big success. And candidates can run without big donations in the city. They've seen more diverse candidates. There's less influence for special interests, more involved citizenry and this is a surprise really, a higher voter turnout 
uh, after the voucher program was established. New York City has a match program. It's six to one. I think it's going up to eight to one soon. And uh, candidates for both of these programs must agree to contribution limits, of course. In New York City, the top contribution is 175 that will earn a match. And so the candidate would get about $1,000 in public funds for that citizen contribution. Um, we still have, of course, the public subsidy program for candidates, and that uh, provides them with about $5,000 per year. And we also have the $50 contribution refund program, uh, which, which allows donors to recover $50 of the amount they give to a candidate. Both are important. Both would have been uh, abolished under Representative Greenman's bill. This report recognizes, as Professor Pearson pointed out, that money matters when it comes to legislating, both as to who sits in the legislature and influencing committee action. Giving money opens campaigns or opens doors, and the bigger the contribution, the wider the door is open. The Humphrey School's research shows that donors gained access to legislators, including the opportunity to testify and the opportunity to provide information to legislators. And that doesn't even look at the relationship between lobbyists who uh, provide contributions to a legislator and their relationship, which is very significant in determining the outcome of legislation. And of course, the power of wielding the gavel in our legislature is enormous. Uh, the Senate this season has, this session has simply refused to hear any election reform bills. I think we need more democracy reformers in the Senate myself. Um, does all this really matter? Most of us support issues like gun safety, uh, good health care for all, transparent political contributions, fair redistricting, limiting carbon emissions, and regulation of mining. And yet there's been little progress made due to the impact of big money. Um, some of the groups involved in money and politics have names like uh, Issue One or Democracy First, and they want to make the point that until you solve money in politics, um, the other issues that we care about are not going to be advanced. Strong public support for democracy reform is the answer. And uh, hopefully this program will contribute to that. Thank you. Thank you, George. Um, you know, in reading this report, one of the things that, that really stood out to me was just the, the vast amounts of stuff, the, the large amounts of money that, that went into the 2020 election. And I wanted to sort of set the stage here a little bit, talk about the stakes, about why perhaps we saw so much money flow into last year's election. I think, you know, I just want to remind people that last year's election, you know, we had all 201 legislative seats on, on the ballot. We had, you know, a, a Senate race, the presidential race. Um, but the 2020 election also, you know, would, would help determine which parties are in power during a really important once in a decade process called redistricting. So my question to Professor Pearson and, and George, I'm just curious to get a sense about whether, you know, that type of issue being at stake and, and donors and political parties being well aware about what districting, what redistricting means for them. Could you explain a little bit whether that helped contribute to, to this rise in so many donations or were we just going to see this amount of money flow in regardless? Um, thank you, Ricardo. So there's no doubt that the 2020 elections were high stakes at every level, at the national level, at the presidential level. I mean, Minnesota for a time um, earlier in the cycle was viewed as potentially a swing state. Obviously, the Minnesota's House districts, uh, 
two, three of them were very competitive. Actually, four had switched parties in the 2018 election, sort of uh, with no net change, but signifying um, just how competitive some of these seats were. Um, and of course, with redistricting, as you know, that the consequences of the legislative races, which were also very, um, very close, were, were great. Um, but we've seen this increase in spending with every successive election cycle. And so there's no doubt that some of the donors, some of the independent expenditures um, were, were made with sort of special attention to the high stakes of the 2020 elections. But it is also the case, uh, both including what we found and uh, a lot of political science research at the national level, that a lot of donors are giving to get access. Um, and that doesn't change from cycle to cycle. So I guess sort of a short version of an answer would be yes, definitely money flows um, because of the competitive of stakes, but money is always important um, because donors like to get access to politicians. Well, I would add, Ricardo, that redistricting is crucial. Um, it is the way that uh, one political party has gained control in states all across the country um, when, when they're in charge of both houses of the legislature and the governorship. Um, when that comes, we call that the trifecta. And when that happens, it's possible to draw a map, which uh, the other side is not going to be able to overcome. Um, happened in Wisconsin. And uh, that's what we hope to, to prevent in Minnesota. In Wisconsin, about 60% uh, of the votes for legislative candidates statewide uh, produced only about 40% of the state assembly. And that was completely because of the way the maps were drawn in 2011. Um, so that's, I don't know what's more crucial than that. I mean, if you can actually control an election by the way you draw the maps, there's a huge incentive to make sure that you have people in the legislature that will get you what you want. Um, and in Minnesota, things are a little different. We always, we, uh, we uh, usually go to court to draw our maps because we've had, um, we haven't had a trifecta in Minnesota for some time. And uh, the smart people think that that's gonna happen again this year. And uh, so the, our maps haven't been too bad. We just want to avoid what, what, what Wisconsin uh, has done. You know, there was one aspect of the report that I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about because, you know, as, as you mentioned, George, you know, right now the Minnesota Senate is, is controlled by Republicans and, and has been averse to sort of passing any of those uh, Democrat uh, DFL sponsored bills on, on election reform. But this, you know, as the report highlights, this seems to be a bipartisan issue, right? Where we're seeing both parties take advantage of uh, independent expenditures to support their candidates or or their causes. So, uh, you know, I guess this question is to both of you. But I, you know, tell us a little bit more about what this bipartisan nature of of, of uh, campaign finance and, and the dark money that that goes into campaigns. Well, I'll go first. Um... This is a completely bipartisan issue. Both pol political parties are spending huge amounts of money. And I think one thing the report points out is that the DFL has outspent um, the Republican Party in Minnesota in, in several races. Um, I don't know if you can blame them because you have to be competitive and if if your opponent is spending huge amounts of money, you have to do something about that. Um, but the, the DFL has always been the party that claims to uh, control spending, control contributions, and yet they are doing the same thing. So I guess it emphasizes that reform is impartial and bipartisan. And um, I think it's a fact that both parties are really quite comfortable with the way things are going right now. And it's going to take um, 
a huge public reaction to change that. And I, I think that will become evident and possible in the next few years. I, I uh, certainly agree with everything that George has said, um, that it is uh, a dark money, independent expenditures, the high volume of spending, fundraising. Um, it is a bipartisan issue. And you know the, the donors trying to gain access, certainly a bipartisan issue as well. Um, also nationally, um, I'm thinking to a recent report by the Center for Responsive Politics that found that there was more than $1 billion of dark money in 2020 nationally. Of course, we just look at Minnesota and actually Democrats uh, benefited more from these dark, this dark money than Republicans did in 2020. So, um, but on the other hand, it is democratic legislation, um, HR1, that actually uh, calls for more disclosure so that to sort of get out of um, the business of dark money. So both parties are doing it, Democrats uh, even more so in 2020, yet Democrats are leading the reform issue when it comes to dark money specifically. And so, you know, I, what, what was the genesis of all this? I mean, I, I think this is something that a lot of people sort of tied to the Citizens United Supreme Court decision, but I'm curious if, if that was really the start of, of, of a lot of this um, independent expenditure money that, that has obscured so the source of these political contributions. Can, can you shed a little light on, on whether it was that that sort of set us on this, on this course or are, are, have there been other um, changes at a national or state level that, that have gotten us to where we are? Well, we've always had a problem with money in politics. And uh, during the Nixon era, it was coming in dollars and suitcases into the uh, headquarters for the campaign. Um, and that did result in some uh, good legislation, uh, the McCain-Feingold law, which helped significantly in controlling the problem. But every time you make a change here, somebody figures out how to cheat. And uh, that soon happened. And, you know, campaign, campaign Citizens United was a five to four Supreme Court um, decision. So we had five Supreme Court justices deciding that uh, money was free speech. <clears throat> well, no, most people think that just doesn't make sense. And this may be coming back to the court again, uh, but since the Citizens United and the rise of super PACs, the problem has been enormous. And it's been coupled with the uh, possibility of dark money. And that's really controlled by the IRS and they allow nonprofits to keep their um, contributor secret, which is really contrary to the statute that they're operating under. That obviously needs to change. <coughs> Excuse me, in Minnesota, we have, we allow um, dark money in expenditures just before an election, depending on the words you use in your ad, and which is pretty remarkable if you think about it. Um, so if you say vote for or defeat, um, you have to disclose your contributors. But if you say, take a close look at the record, <coughs> excuse me, of, of Representative Jones, you can hide whoever's giving you money to uh, put it out that ad just before the election. Um, and, and that, you know, there's been legislation proposed almost every session to cure that. It's in uh, the bill again this year. It's in 19 other states have cleaned that up. Minnesota is lagging behind and it shouldn't be. It's also worth noting that reform efforts have been complicated since the 1976 Supreme Court decision, Buckley versus Vallejo, which ruled that spending limits um, were uh, unconstitutional because they would violate free speech. And so Citizens United obviously um, took this much, much further, allowing uh, corporations, unions to, uh, to spend on their own independently. But the problem really uh, in many ways dates back um, 
to the mid-1970s with the Supreme Court's response to Congress's efforts um, to rein in campaign finance. And so with every decision, there, there's been adaptations um, with soft money and, and, and the magic words and, and so forth, as George has described. And so it, it's been a longstanding problem, but it just continues to get worse. So before we shift to some of the questions here that, that have come in, I just had one more question before that. But what are some of the, the biggest consequences? What, what are what's some of the corrosive um, effects of having money like this flow? I, mean, I know we've touched a little bit on it in terms of who gets access to lawmakers, um, who gets to testify and what sort of information flows um, to those who are in power to make decisions. But, you know, what is sort of the long-term risk in, in, in having so much money that, that is untraceable or, or unaccountable to voters? Well, I have one example, and it's the oil and gas industry. Not only do they get huge deductions under federal tax law, but they get special treatment from Congress. And um, what's the consequence? The consequence is endangering the health of everybody in the world. Um, now, most people, I think, as I said, want to control emissions and want to uh, prevent uh, climate change from happening. Um, it just seems evident in a matter of self-preservation. Um, but people are actively working for short-term profits over the welfare of the people of this country and, and the world. And uh, that's an example of something that I don't know any, anything that's much more important than that. Um, that's something that we have to address. If you think about uh, agenda setting in the US Congress and legislatures, um, party leaders, uh, majority party leaders obviously have a lot of influence, but party leaders are also extremely concerned about staying in the majority. And these days in contemporary politics uh, at the national level and in many states such as Minnesota, the margins are very, very slim. And so party leaders, as they set the agenda, are responsive uh, to big donors. Um, and you know, it's not necessarily going to change their vote. It may in some circumstances, but it's sort of, there's limited time whose agenda items get to the surface. And then at the individual legislator level, um, there's been some interesting political science research that has uh, sort of varied the message uh, to a member of Congress as to whether or not someone requesting a meeting was a campaign contributor or not. And members of Congress are much more likely to meet with campaign contributors um, than ordinary constituents. And so I think the evidence is mounting, um, both nationally and in states uh, across the country, that that these contributions gain access both to leaders who set the agenda and to individual members uh, who can influence dynamics in committees. Um, it's harder to detect this influence once there is a vote on final passage, but it's really, really in the agenda setting uh, process by, by party leadership and at the committee level where research is, is finding this influence. And you know, just to add to that, Ricardo, uh, we know that People in Congress are spending like 30 to 40 hours per week calling donors. And presumably these are donors with some money um, and they're listening to what these donors want to see done in Congress. Um, and you know, we know this from 60 Minutes and we know this from our local Congress people uh, that this is happening. Well, it's just a perversion of what a democracy should be all about. They should be paying attention to constituents and legislating, not spending time dialing for dollars. One more addition to that. Not only that, party leaders are demanding that individual legislators are contributing to their party. And so members of Congress are being rewarded on key committees, uh, depending on whether or not they pay their dues uh, to the party campaign committees. And so it is really infiltrated um, the legislative culture. Well, I can't top that. <laughs> well, I was going to ask, you know, it, you know, on top of those things, I'm just curious if, if either of you see a relationship between, you know, we're, we're talking about how lawmakers give a lot of access to donors and, and you know, the, the way that con campaign contributions contribute to the agenda that is set. But what about the responsiveness of, of um, Congress to its constituents, the legislature to its constituents? 
constituents, you see a danger in a, in, in a population of voters who, who feels disenfranchised or disempowered and how that you know, contributes to the distrust in institutions, right? I mean, I think that's something that, that we saw a lot uh, in, in, in the last couple of years. I mean, it's contributed to a sense that, that, um, uh, that maybe fueled some of the sentiments around the, the January 6th attack on the Capitol, this idea that if, if we're not being paid attention to, we're, we're going to do something about it, you know, and, and that sort of sentiment I think exists on, on, on you know, uh, in different sort of political persuasions, but, but is there a danger when, uh, when a representative democracy it becomes really disconnected from its grassroots voters. I think that's a very good point. And um, if people lose faith in voting and lose faith in democracy and don't participate, we have an extremely serious problem in our country. Um, we have to make sure that people feel empowered and that they see that their vote makes a difference. Um, and so, you know, of course, things like voter suppression, which is now happening all over the country, or at least attempted, including in Minnesota, um, have, to, have to be defeated. Voting is the number one thing in our democracy, and uh, we can't allow it to be suppressed. Yeah, I agree. And just many, people across the country don't feel represented by their member of Congress. And sort of one of the most important determinants is of this lack of, of a link between a member of Congress um, and their constituents is, is a, a difference in party identification. So increasingly, Democrats don't feel represented by their member of Congress if that member is a Republican and vice versa. And so that's a real problem. But campaign finance is also a problem, particularly the team dynamic uh, with the two parties, where it is, it is such a zero sum game. And it really also, it deteriorates relationships among members of Congress with one another as well. Um, so, you know, caucuses have, bipartisan caucuses have fallen apart because members have campaigned for the opponent uh, of one of their other members that they used to have a good relationship with. And so the partisan team nature of just the massive amount of fundraising um, in this competitive environment is part of the problem. And just to add to that, um, gerrymandering is a huge problem in that regard. If you're in a district where you just have no chance of your party prevailing because of the way the maps were drawn, um, you start to lose interest in participating in, in democracy. So top that, Catherine. You've got the last word on that. <laughs> So, you know, we've touched a little bit on, on a couple Supreme Court cases that, that have had, you know, big ramifications on campaign finance and transparency, but can anything really be done on this as long as, you know, money is speech as, as the Supreme Court has, has ruled in Citizens United, um, you know, and, and what about, I mean, what would it take to change that? Would it be something like a constitutional amendment? I mean, what, what can we do? Well, we strongly support reversing the Citizens United decision with a, an amendment to the Constitution. There are two or three national organizations working very hard on that. Um, it's a long-term proposition. I mean, you have to, two thirds of Congress has to propose an amendment and it has to be adopted by three quarters of the states. So that's a big hurdle, but it's not an excuse not to keep working on it because it's the number one problem in in our uh, electoral system right now. Yeah, I, right. I agree. <laughs> um, so here's another question that, that someone submitted, you know, it talked a little bit about the the research around, you know, committee work. Um, but I, I'm curious if you found that uh, of those who testified in committee hearings on bills, on topics, I mean, were, were they primarily made up by people who had donated or were there people who had not donated before and, and, and worked as testifiers? Um, curious if you, if, if you could talk a little bit about that more specifically and what, um, you know, what, what we're seeing there. 
Sure. Oh, a range of people testified at all of these committees, um, including many people from relevant departments, um, uh, sort of agencies, groups, some some concerned citizens. So in in no way were donors the only people testifying. So I don't mean to imply that, um, but it it does matter um, that these donors uh, were able to get the ear of these seven key committees, um, whether they were testifying in favor of something or uh, against something. And this is also consistent with other research, both at the national level and other states, that finds that committee chairs, party leaders, get the most money um, and that uh, amendments are more likely to be offered in committees. We didn't look specifically at amendments, we just looked at um, committee uh, testimony, but amendments are more likely to be offered um, at sort of by members who get campaign contributions from the groups that are particularly affected. I'm thinking here of, of Richard Hall's uh, research on that. And so, so there, you know, there's a lot to sort out here and donors are not, are not the only ones, but um, it's certainly relevant that their, their interests are heard um, before committees and the members who sit on these committees know that they were their donors. I mean, that is quite clear. And I think it may be the case that really big contributors and special interests are a little shy about showing up in committee hearings. Um, the one I did this morning uh, was a state government uh, conference committee. And the commenters were a lot of organizations and, um, and also some individual citizens, but you didn't see anybody showing up to say, well, I think provisional ballots are a terrific idea and gosh, we really need voter ID because of all the fraud. Um, so I think a lot of that takes place between uh, lobbyists and legislators and contacts from individuals. Um, every legislator knows who is giving him the big bucks and uh, they're not gonna close the door and not listen to that person or organization. So what is the best way to make all political contributions transparent? Um, and, and how do you institute a cap on campaign spending? Is, uh, I'm just curious if either of you have any, any thoughts on that. Maybe, maybe start with you, George. Well, um, as I said, I think pub public uh, contributions are the best answer right now. And you know, some countries support their elections entirely by public funds. And, and boy, does that clear up a lot of problems that, that we are involved in. Um, but there are other essential programs uh, like uh, a match or vouchers or um, that sort of thing that would make a significant change in how our system operates. So I think, I think that's an important approach. Um, I think we need to keep working on Citizens United. Um, and we, we have to keep in mind that really this is the, the basis and the root of corruption uh, in our system. And I, I'm talking about legal corruption. Um, I don't have any evidence of somebody handing a bag of money to a legislator. But these, these are ways to influence that are presently allowed by law now by both the Supreme Court and, and Congress. So let's change a few of these things like dark money that's allowed by the IRS. Um, I'm pretty sure that if voters know who's giving the money to a candidate, they're gonna think that's an important factor in, in making up their mind. And we need to provide them with that information. Yeah, I will echo. I will echo George's call for massively increased disclosure. It's really important. And then it is also important, thinking about federal money, that the FEC um, can do its job. It is often deadlocked, and Congress often doesn't give it the resources to actually do its job. And so, when candidates don't follow the laws that exist, they're often, it often, you know, takes a while to find them and the public doesn't even know that. And so uh, a, a stronger empowered federal election uh, commission would be also critically important to any reforms. Um, of course, any spending limits would need to be voluntary, but these um, 
additional public subsidies could give candidates a real incentive um, to abide by them. And Catherine, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think reform of the FEC is in uh, HR1, is it not? It is. Yes, it is. So I think that would create a five member body uh, with the chair appointed by the administration and they'd actually be able to do something which they haven't for a number of years now. They've simply been deadlocked or uh, members have not been appointed in a timely manner. That's right. That's right. So the FEC really has not been able to do its job, even as we are lamenting the fact that it doesn't have a bigger job to do. Um, and just, you know, it's wonderful that, that so many people are listening today, but just increased citizen awareness and having citizens make demands on their legislators um, for, for reform and, and, and in both parties, um, I think is really important. And it's so easy to lay, let your legislature, your legislator know uh, what's on your mind and, and what you're doing. They, all you have to do is email them or leave a voicemail, or if you know how to tweet, you can tweet. And, and uh, there's no excuse for not letting them know. You know, I've, I've heard that as few as six emails get the attention of a legislator and uh, that's not that hard to accomplish. I can vouch for that. They're very responsive, especially now in, in a more digital age that has been <clears throat> hastened by the pandemic. But um, my question, Professor Pearson, for you was, was there anything in this report that surprised you? I mean, I, just kind of looking at, at some of these um, trends, I mean, I was surprised to see a little bit about the, the um, uh, District 5 race, the U.S. House race. And, and, and you know, you, you talked earlier about how in competitive races, dark money, uh, comprises the, the bulk of uh, spending in, in, a part, in competitive races, but we didn't quite see that in that race. We saw a large number of individual donations pour in, um, but I'm just curious, I mean, if, if that surprised you or if there were any other parts in, in, in your report that, that, um, that, you know, that you were a little surprised to see. I mean, sadly, I was not surprised by the continued increase and massive spending and dominance of independent expenditures and competitive races. But I was surprised by the, the fact that the fifth district comprised uh, the most spending of any of Minnesota's eight congressional districts. Districts. Representative Omar won re-election by 64 uh, was 64%. Now that's she did not perform as well as uh, President Biden did um, by several percentage points in the fifth district. Um, but nonetheless, it is a safe Democratic seat. And so I think a lot of that was about symbolic politics. Both the Republican Lacey Johnson, a political newcomer, um, and uh, incumbent Omar, they both raised uh, the majority of their funds from outside the district. And so because she has attracted so much national attention, um, both from supporters and opponents, I think that that really fueled uh, the money in that race. Um, I would be surprised if that was repeated two years from now, um, especially given redistricting and other competitive races in Minnesota. Um, Minnesota's second district race was also quite competitive, perhaps even more competitive than um, campaign donors might have guessed. So that was a very competitive race. Uh, Angie Craig, Representative Craig was reelected narrowly um, and the campaign finance didn't necessarily reflect that as the, the first and the seventh district, of course, um, there was just a ton of money spent in independent expenditures in both of those districts. And so I think that because Representative Craig was reelected narrowly and midterm election years are um, typically not as good for the president's party, although again, stay tuned with redistricting. Um, I suspect that we will see uh, more fundraising both by the candidates in the second district and more independent expenditure activity in 2022. You know, the 2020 election was was unusual in a lot of different ways. Um, one of the things that, that one of the questions here I, I'm, I'm reading is, is about, you know, the, the, the spending by the Lincoln Project. I'm, I'm curious if we could talk a little bit about, you know, seeing that sort of intra-party opposition, you know, especially in, in the vast amounts of sum that was spent um, against by against you know President Trump by some members of his own party who didn't want to see him reelected. Uh, was that unusual? I mean, or is that something that we can expect to see um, happen or, or be facilitated by our current campaign finance laws? Well, I don't know much about that, but I'll still talk about it. Um, 
I thought that was a wonderful development. Um, there should be discussion and uh, opposing views within both political parties. And I think that there'll, there'll be a little more of that in the next few years, but it's something that needs to happen. And, you know, a lot of people think that a two-party political system maybe is not the ideal uh, way to run a, com a company, a country. And um, there's, there's, there's some sense to that. Um, so I think, uh, I think any kind of uh, opposing viewpoints within a political party are extremely healthy. And um, I, I don't know that campaign finance is gonna affect that one way or another, but it's certainly something that we need to see more of. I agree that I agree that conflict within uh, within a party is typically good for democracy. Um, in the sense, a lot of people are represented in areas that really only have one party who could possibly be elected, and so having some competition um, in a primary uh, within within a party can be a good thing for democracy and for representation and for people's views. Um, sort of the intra-party conflict once. One, once you know a president is nominated, in this case we had an incumbent running for re-election, that's unusual, and that was that was particular to Trump. Um, nonetheless, we continue to see that divide within the Republican Party um, with what we're witnessing with with Liz Cheney right now, and so you know that of course still centers on Donald Trump, but I think we can expect that um, money will play into this as well, particularly as we see uh, Republicans going to Wyoming to campaign against Liz Cheney. I mean, so money gets involved in, in all of these conflicts as well. Um, here's another question from, from one of our um, viewers today, but you know, is there any evidence that if money were truly removed from politics or at least more transparent that voters would be more active in the political process beyond simply voting um, you know, for instance, we, you know, generally people in the state, while are pretty decent voters, um, you know, don't typically know who their state representative or state senator are. So, you know, is there any evidence that we'll see more active political participation by, by sort of regular voters if we remove big money from politics or, or make it more transparent? Well, you know, in Minnesota, we always toot our horn about 80% voting in an election, and, and that's terrific. Uh, we want to maintain and increase that. But there are a couple of indications that uh, less money means that people participate more. And I think I've mentioned the Seattle vouchers, which uh, passed out $25 vouchers, four of them, to each registered voter. And uh, it had the good result of um, more diverse candidates, um, but it also had the result of people being more interested in uh, the election. And uh, people also um, being more involved in the, in the entire process. So that's certainly a possibility. Um, and again, I think another uh, area that impinges on that is uh, gerrymandering. Um, if we can put a stop to that kind of activity, uh, there's going to be more people thinking, oh, well, I think maybe I have a chance to get my, my vote counted here and, and uh, have it uh, considered and uh, I'll, get, I'll jump into it. Yeah, uh, great points. The, the other point I would make is that this massive, massive spending is concentrated in a minority of races. And so a lot of races, which are viewed as safe for one party's candidate or the other's party candidate because of the demographics of a particular district, um, don't get a lot of spending at all. And so uh, voters might not even know who a challenger is or who both candidates are. And so that's not necessarily good for democracy. So you have you know, donors um, making contributions that are you know, heavily 
focused on the most competitive races and these donors getting a lot of attention in the agenda setting process. And then you have some races which don't get any attention at all, leaving voters to wonder who the candidates are. And so an increased public subsidy would allow, you know, voters who are running in a race that is probably not competitive, but nonetheless, they could still get their name out, their message out um, and build a following in their district among voters who agree with them. And sort of because of our current system, that is sort of foreclosed as well. I mean, there is a couple of questions here about what we could do sort of with, as it relates to uh, members of Congress to, to help limit the influence of big money. But one of them is, you know, what about a couple of changes like, you know, making, uh, passing a law, restricting the, the hours and times of day that can spend, you know, making calls to donors or what about changing, you know, their term limits from, from two to four so that they don't have to, you know, sort of spend just two years in office and, and spend the bulk of that fundraising, um, you know, and, and what, what change can be sort of, I mean, made, if we've talked a little bit about it around, um, you know, there, there are a lot of parties that rely, you know, on singular party, mem you know, members of their party who, who are pr prodigious fundraisers. So, you know, are there any changes that can be made, you know, at that level that, that can help limit the influence of, of big money? Well, I think the two to four year proposition is interesting. Um, also interesting are term limits. You can only serve there for 10 years or whatever, and you don't get a lot of seniority and therefore attract a lot of uh, special interests that want to be very good to you. Um, so that's, I think that's a good approach. And uh, my other interest right now is why shouldn't we have a few more justices? Um, my, my opinion is that the last administration packed the court by denying an appointment to the Obama and also rushing through um, a confirmation right at the end of Trump's uh, presidential term. So, why wouldn't it be fair for uh, give them a little more help uh, on the court and uh, see if we can get things balanced? It is, we are almost up and I can't believe it. I have found something that I disagree with George on and that is uh, legislative term limits. Um, pol political scientists disagree on a lot of things but political scientists are nearly united um, in this consensus this consensus that legislative term limits are bad based on a lot of research um, that shows that term limits really just give away legislature's power to other sources such as lobbyists, special interest and, and, and the executive um, that, you know, these days, especially with so much money, members of Congress don't have that many incentives to specialize um, and sort of the ability to build up a long career, becoming an expert on a committee um, is an important one. Well, that sounds like a great topic to <laughs> to have another discussion around term limits and and whether we should have them. But we're getting closer here to the to um, the, the end of our discussion here. Um, and I just wanted to you know ex you know say that there were many questions, great questions in, in the Q and A that came in that I wasn't able to get to. But I hope that I I asked the ones that people were most interested in. And I just wanted to say thank you to uh, Professor Pearson and George Beck for joining us today. Um, and wanted to just you know hand it back over to Professor Larry Jacobs here um, to to close us out today. So thank you. Oh, Ricardo, I forgot to mention one thing. This is my favorite book. Democracy in Chains. And if you really want to know what's going on in our country, it's written by Nancy McLean, who is a Duke historian and um, based on extensive research. It's almost half footnotes. And uh, I would highly recommend that if you want to look into this further. Thank you very much, George Beck and my colleague, Catherine Pearson and Ricardo Lopez, who did a terrific job moderating. Thank you to all three of you.